Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about pancakes. Personally, if I'm going with butter and syrup, you know, the classic, I like a nice chilled blueberry syrup. Very nice. I'm also a sociopath, though, and I like eating dry pancakes with ranch dressing. I know it's weird, but don't knock it till you try it. I also know that I am very strange and have very strange tastes. But anyway, enough about my strange tastes, and let's talk about some different pancakes, some non-edible ones. The forbidden pancakes, if you will. Yes, today we're going to be talking about some experimental airplanes with rather comical nicknames due to their weird shape. Traditionally, or at least back in the earlier days of aviation, most aircraft had a similar layout, sort of resembling a lowercase t with little feet. While this was a common, sort of tried-and-true layout, this didn't mean that people didn't experiment and try new things. From the earliest days of aviation, people tried to create tailless or fixed-wing aircraft, with most looking sort of like triangles. There are aircraft with different wing shapes, different wing lengths, different wing locations, and different wing structures and control surfaces. Each design choice has its own pros and cons. Longer or high aspect ratio wings give greater lift and roll stability, while shorter or low aspect ratio wings offer greater maneuverability and are generally easier and cheaper to make. Despite it being the case that longer wings offer greater lift on a more conventional design, aeronautical engineer Charles H. Zimmerman decided to experiment a bit and tried to prove a theory that aircraft could fly and generate a lot of lift with extremely short, low aspect ratio wings. From this, a very peculiar aircraft design was born. The Vought V-173, aka the Flying Pancake. Initial testing on this concept by Zimmerman can be seen in one of his earlier projects, the V-162, which was a small, remote-controlled airplane that would be pretty similar to the V-173. In 1939, the V-162 design concept had the U.S. Navy interested, so a full-scale prototype design was ordered. The resulting design was a little bit different than the original 162 concept, but largely remained the same. It was basically a circle, hence the nickname Flying Pancake, measuring in at 26 feet 8 inches long with a wingspan of just 23 feet 4 inches. The V-173 was propelled by two large three-bladed propellers, powered by two Continental A-80 engines. These engines were just 80 horsepower each, but speed wasn't the intent with the initial design, so that didn't really matter. The Navy was more interested in the design for its potential at being a fighter plane that could take off vertically, as that would make taking off from a carrier much easier and faster. So that aspect was the main focus of this prototype design. The propellers at each front edge of the plane spun in directions opposite to the natural air vortex that formed on the tip of each wing. This was done to cancel out that air vortex and reduce the drag effect it would normally cause. The large size of the propellers would also ensure that there was a continuous airflow over the entire surface of the aircraft, and as the entire plane was kept flat, the entire body of the plane would act as a wing and generate lift. For a little wing comparison here, let's look at another U.S. Navy fighter, the F-6F Hellcat. Now, recall the listed length and width of the V-173. I'll put it on the screen here, too. The Hellcat came in with a length of 33 feet 7 inches and a wingspan of 42 feet 10 inches, a wingspan almost double that of the 173. The total wing area, though, was 427 feet for the 173 and just 334 for the Hellcat. Despite being a smaller plane overall, the V-173 using its entire body as a wing meant that it had more wing area than basically any other U.S. fighter. At the front of the plane, the cockpit area almost looks like a little pimple, gradually jutting out of the front of the body. The 22-degree angle that the plane sat at on the ground was so severe that windows were added to the underside of the cockpit so that the pilot could see when taking off. To keep the bulk of the plane's weight along the central axis so as to give it greater maneuverability, 
The two engines were placed not behind the propellers like normal, but rather towards the center axis on each side of the cockpit. A system of gears and shafts connected the engines to the propellers, and these systems were connected in a way that if a single engine were to fail, the remaining engine could power both propellers. Attached to the rear were two horizontal stabilizers that controlled both roll and pitch, aka elevators, and two vertical stabilizers were included to help control the yaw. Given that this version of the aircraft was more of a proof of concept than anything else, it was not outfitted with any weaponry and was basically unarmored, with a mostly wooden body and just a simple fabric covering. Initial testing of the V-173 up in Connecticut showed that there were quite a few kinks that still needed to be worked out. Initial taxiing tests found that the gear system connecting the engines to the propellers produced a lot of vibration. Additionally, initial flight testing, which began on November 23rd, 1942, found that the controls felt overly heavy and it could not reach speeds high enough to actually allow the plane to level out in flight. There is footage of this and I'll go ahead and play a little bit now. Of course, link to the full video down in the description. There's no audio for this video, at least not for how I found it, but I imagine it having a very stereotypical radio voice guy talking about how this plane will really help in the Pacific War using some, shall we say, outdated terminology. Keep in mind that there were just two 80 horsepower engines, so max speed was found to be just around 138 miles an hour, no doubt adding to that not leveling out issue. The cockpit was also found to be rather uncomfortable, and the underside windows didn't really help due to how the pilot was positioned in the cockpit. There were also issues with landing the plane, as with the entire body acting as a lifting surface, when it approached the ground and the tail came closer to the ground, air became trapped underneath and forced the tail back up. This would lead to the installation of two flaps at the tail of the plane that lifted up when landing letting air pass under and preventing the tail from bouncing back upwards. Despite these issues, the V-173 was still a major success in that it showed that almost vertical takeoff on a propeller-powered plane was actually possible. With no wind assistance, it could successfully take off in just 200 feet. In a 25-knot headwind, it could take off with no run whatsoever, giving it the ability to take off vertically. Of course, being able to take off vertically like that, it's no wonder that the Navy would be interested in this concept for potential use on aircraft carriers. Additionally, in the flight testing, it was found that it was basically not possible to stall the plane out. Quoting from test pilot Boone T. Guyton, he found that, I was able to apply full power, raise the nose as high as it could be held, and have control about all three axes without stalling. He is also quoted as saying, the aircraft could not be completely stalled or even approach a spin condition. He did also note that the plane decelerated significantly in a turn and that the vibration issue was still present. It was also found to be a bit difficult to control at lower speeds. Regardless though, the proof of concept for a vertical takeoff was successful. Before that first test flight in 1942 though, the initial wind tunnel testing proved interesting enough that another prototype was requested, this time one that could be a functional military prototype. This led to the Navy requesting a slightly altered version of the V-173 known as the XF-5U, also known as the Flying Flapjack. The XF-5U retained most of the V-173's design, with some improvements and alterations that would be needed for a standard military aircraft. The cockpit was moved slightly forward and resembled one that would be seen on more conventional aircraft. It was also slightly larger with listed dimensions of 28 feet 7 inches long, 32 feet 6 inches wide, and with a total wing area of 475 square feet. Now intended for military use, it would need significantly improved armor, armaments, and engines. It would now use two Pratt & Whitney XR2000 engines, each having 1,350 horsepower, almost 17 times the amount of horsepower of the Continental engines. 
it would also have a metal body, increasing the weight from just 2,200 pounds on the V173 to over 16,000. While it would never actually be outfitted with weapons, it was given spots for up to six 50 caliber machine guns and 2,000 pound bombs. The expected max speed would also increase dramatically over the V173, going from just 138 miles an hour to nearly 460 miles an hour. The propellers were also changed from being three blades to four blades. It was also determined in the V173 testing that the propellers needed articulation for proper performance. While these propellers were being made, other propellers from the F4U Corsair were used in the meantime. Now, because of the ongoing war, more conventional, already proven aircraft took precedence, so despite the XF5U being requested sometime between January and September 1942, different sources have different dates on this, the XF5U, without the special propellers, would be completed sometime in mid-1945, and the special propellers would not be added until 1946. The first test with this completed prototype model would begin on February 3rd, 1947. These were just taxi tests, though, and concerns over excessive vibrations and engine overheating meant that the testing would never actually proceed past this stage. It would make small, so-called hops in these tests, but was never actually flown for any significant period of time. The XF-5U experiment would be officially cancelled just over a month later, on March 17, 1947, and the earlier V-173 would see its last flight just over two weeks later, albeit with actual flight time and test flights under its belt, 131.8 hours over 190 flights, to be precise. The XF-5U would unfortunately be scrapped, but the V-173 would live on, being kept in storage until 1960, where it would be placed on display at the National Air and Space Museum. It would later be moved back into storage until 2003, when it was moved to Dallas, Texas for restoration. It now resides on display at the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas. So, sadly, the V-173 and XF-5U both fizzled out and basically just became little, interesting pieces of history. But why? Testing showed some flaws and issues, but it did demonstrate the ability for short and vertical takeoff, and would hypothetically be an interesting plane for carrier use. So, what happened? Well, to put it simply, it was dropped due to technological advancement. I went over this a bit in another video, which I will link to, but in early 1944, the P-80 Shooting Star took its first flight and would later be adopted in 1945. This plane was America's first adopted jet fighter. Even before that, the U.S. began flight testing on the P-59 Aerocomet in 1942, the first produced jet fighter in the United States. Jet fighters were here, so a fighter plane based around propeller propulsion in 1947 was just way out of date. There was simply no need for a fighter like the V-173 or XF-5U now. Technological advancement made them obsolete. The vertical takeoff concept would continue in testing, though, and the first successful jet-powered vertical takeoff plane would be seen in 1957 with the British SC-1. It can also be seen today in planes like the F-35 and Harrier jets. Now before we end, I want to quickly mention two more things about the V-173. First, due to its round shape, it was responsible for several UFO sighting reports in Connecticut during its testing. Second, during a test, the V-173 had to make an emergency landing on a beach. While attempting to land, the pilot noticed that he was quickly approaching two sunbathers. Rather than crash into them, he decided to lock the brakes on landing, forcing the plane to flip over forwards, thus landing upside down. Somehow, the plane wasn't damaged in any significant way in this flip, thus both the plane and the sunbathers survived the crash landing. A happy ending for everyone involved. Alright, and that's where we'll go ahead and end for today. Uh, thank you all for watching the video, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and just give your dog a big ol' hug.
He's a good boy. He deserves it. I'll be back next week, probably, with a new video, maybe one about Vietnam, or maybe one about propaganda. I don't know. I haven't actually decided yet at the time of me recording this. But when I do, I hope you'll watch that one, and for this one at least, I hope you learned something. So, later.